Uh, hi everyone and welcome to today's uh, webinar. My name is Paul Adepojo and I'm the Community Manager for the ICFJ uh, Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum. Uh, since the outset of the glo uh, global pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we've been uh, organizing a series of webinars uh, that are geared towards uh, improving uh, journalists' capability and their ability to report uh, the various aspects uh, of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, from the strains, from the uh, gene sequencing, uh, to public health response, to dealing with uh, misinformation and other issues. Uh, We've been actively uh, engaging our journalists and expanding their body of knowledge. And uh, at different stages in the COVID-19 pandemic, different issues have been at the forefront. And the current one that the world is dealing with is uh, uh, expanding vaccine access and encouraging more people to actually uh, accept these vaccines. But as uh, just like any other pharmaceutical product, uh, vaccines could also have some potential side effects. So as journalists, how do you report uh, these uh, potential side effects of COVID-19 vaccine? And how do you ensure that even while reporting reporting the story, uh, your story uh, or your reporting is not uh, creating uh, vaccine excitancy uh, among, among the people. And that is the issue that we'll be dealing with today. And we have a freelance journalist uh, who, who, uh, who came highly recommended uh, by the Association of Healthcare Journalists uh, who, has, who have been partnering with us uh, to organize uh, the previous webinar and this particular one. Her name is Kerry. Uh, Kerry, how are you doing today? Good. I'm doing fine, Paul. How are you? I'm really fine. Thank you very much for joining us today. So if you are joining us on the uh, on the Zoom platform, I encourage you to use the Q&A option uh, for your questions. And if you are watching this live stream on Facebook, uh, if you have any question that you, that you would like Kerry uh, to answer, I encourage you to also put it in the chat, but in the comment box below the live stream video that you're watching right now. So we'll start with uh, Kerry's presentation and uh, we, are, we are going to have an engaging section, interactive session uh, after our presentation. Uh, so Kerry, uh, can you share your screen? And uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks. I'm gonna go back. Um, so to start with, um, this is my information. I am what they call the core topic leader. I write about patient safety for the Association of Healthcare Journalists. So even after this presentation, if you have questions, please feel free to email me or to send me a message on Twitter on things that you think would be good for us to cover in depth. If you have questions on covering the vaccines, that's helpful for us. And we may write on this topic or I can get back to you and, and try and help as I can. Um, this is really one of the most critical tasks we have this year is writing about the vaccines and, and helping people understand what, what are the few very serious side effects we've seen. And also to get an, a handle on some of the concerns out there that so far appear to be unfounded. So you really wanna be very sensitive in covering this. It's, it's, I mean, everything we report on as journalists, we wanna do a great job. We wanna be perfectly accurate. We wanna put things in context, but this is really an important one. These are the kind of stories for which you wanna um, take a step back, take a deep breath before you report them. These are cases where you may have to push back a bit and tell your editors or producers or other folks that you need a little extra time to go through the numbers again, to get a, a really good voice, to get, get a really good comment. Um, I was thinking in, of this, this being like, um, you see a big plane come in, like a large 747, it needs a lot of runway. So these are stories that are, they need a little bit of explaining. And this is not something you wanna cover in a brief and, um, and jump on to the next thing. You really wanna give the stories, uh, whether you're reporting them for radio or television or the web or in print, the, the attention they deserve. Um, so this is the overview of the things we're gonna talk about go through some of the, the two big side effects that have emerged as being very concerning. We'll talk about the biggest persisting rumor. Um, <clears throat> we'll look at some really good examples of how people have discussed uh, the vaccines and concerns about vaccines. And then we'll look at some reporting tips. Uh, the most concerning thing is um, are cases of myocarditis. That's one of, that's the most concerning thing right now. One of the most concerning things. These have emerged in uh, mostly younger men. They're very, very rare. Um, there's, you know, to date, the evidence seems to say that you're better off getting the vaccine than running the risk of getting COVID and possibly getting this, you know, a side effect like this. 
So the data still seem to really favor vaccination, but it's something parents are concerned about. Obviously, young people are concerned about. It's, it's something people are really watching. This New York Times story, I thought, did a really nice job in covering this. So as you can see from the headline, even it's um, this is about a study where they looked at this myocarditis um, and found it was more common after actually COVID than after vaccination. And they just got it, nailed that in the headline. Um, then they say they didn't hit the risks specifically for young men um, who are the most likely to develop the side effect. The story is they, um, sorry, this is the wrong slides. Um, so you can see it's just nice, simple, clear language. The side effect remains rare. Um, then we have, if you go through here, I pulled out big chunks of the text, but this is further down in the story. They had pulled out some really nice quotes. They have this in context with this uh, doctor saying, nobody's blowing this off, um, which I think, I don't know if on your screen that's behind the screen, but um, that the risks of COVID are higher um, than the vaccine. They have some of the, you know, really put some numbers. They have very few numbers, which is a tip we'll get back to later. And they're really in context, like for every 100,000 infections, extra 25 heart attacks and lung clots. Another really good quote here about when you try to make your decision on whether or not you should take the vaccine, one of the things to ask is not only what are the potential adverse effects aside with the vaccine, but also what risk am I taking when I think about it? Um, so again, just um, really nice job here and in context. And we'll go back to this idea again, but they really pulled out like a good number to use. They put it in context. They didn't have too many numbers in the story. Um, in writing on this particular side effect on the myocarditis, if you're in the US, the um, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists has some great resources on this. And in the US, they have them in English and Spanish. So if you're writing for a Spanish speaking audience, the ACOG can help you out with that. They can um, a lot of times put you in touch with um, gynecologists, maybe in your community outside of the US. You can do the same thing a lot of time and work with your medical societies and they will help you find doctors. And you can, you know, a lot of times they can be very helpful. You can specifically ask for a doctor who, you know, maybe a doctor who's had this question themselves, like has the doctor thought about this and at recommending the vaccine for people in their own family. Those kind of comments and questions are really helpful in reporting this and um, helping people understand the side effects and the risks for their family. Um, I'm down here, I'm tacking onto something that my colleague at the Association for Healthcare Journalists, Tara Hall, mentioned last week, which is really helpful. Um, she talked about using PubMed to find sources. And this is, I'm gonna go through it just for a minute. She had mentioned it. Um, if, y'all already know this, apologies, it will be boring, but if you don't, this is such a great source. So if you go to PubMed, you can just type in PubMed. Um, this is the search engine you'll get. And it's really, so you go there and you can put in anything you'd like. Like in this case, I put in vaccine COVID myocarditis and it pulled up um, a bunch of things, a, bunch of, a lot of things in the US. And I got, if I were thinking like, if I were in Virginia, I would pull up this study and I noticed that here's somebody from my area who's reported on it. And this is what's great about PubMed. If you didn't know this already, a lot of times you can find the emails of researchers. So it's a really good way to just get directly to people. It can speed the process. I mean, a lot of times you'll also want to email the researcher's hospital or institution because a lot of times they're going to send you back to PR anyway, but it really gets the ball rolling. It also lets you a chance to email the person and not say, doctor, uh, I'd like to talk to you about your paper on this. You can ask her instead, hey, I, I read your paper. Um, I had some questions on this. And it, it makes it a little bit easier to get the conversation started. Um, and I also looked, so that was it for a US one. If you're looking for your country, if you're um, based outside the US, you can put in your country. Like in this case, I said, if I were in India, I wanted to find people in India who knew about this. So in this case, I looked up myocarditis COVID vaccine India, um, and I didn't get much. I got like, there were only four people or four papers and none of them are actually about directly about the side effect. So that wasn't useful. So then I did, well, what if I just did myocarditis COVID India? And this had 35 results. So if I were looking for a, a doctor to talk to, a researcher um, on this topic and I were in India or you know another any other country, you can put this in it and really try and find somebody local to talk to about this, somebody who knows it. And again, the great thing about PubMed, if you hadn't done this already, is those emails. <laughs> they can get you all the email addresses. 
Um, so that's myocarditis. The other um, thing that's really been a concern with the vaccines is are these rare blood clots and bleeding in the brain. They actually have um, a couple of different really horribly jargony names. In the US, it's known as TTS. Um, in Europe, a lot of times it's called vaccine-induced prothrombotic immune thrombocytopenia. You really wanna stick with the simpler description, but you do need to include in your story these other jargony words because that's what people have read elsewhere. If they want to look at more information on their own, they'll need these terms. Um, I would say it's helpful sometimes too to say, you know, these things are all sort of describing the same thing. So I would introduce the concept of what's happening and then I'd get into the jargon. In the US, um, the American, Hematology, American Society of Hematology has a nice backgrounder. It's a little too technical for, for people who haven't had any background in medicine, but it's, it's pretty helpful for yourself to get kind of grounded in it. Um, and then the UK's National Health Service had a really nice backgrounder with really much more simple language. So if I were reporting on this for my local audience, I would wanna kind of read at least both of these things, um, maybe call some people based on that. If you're in the US, again, the um, American Society of Hematology, known as ASH, is very helpful. Um, in, in other countries, you may wanna look for, so your hematologist you'd wanna to talk to, maybe hospital specialist, emergency medicine doctors. A really interesting story on this can be um, what your local hospitals did to prepare to treat people for this side effect, even if it didn't happen. I, I'm writing a story about some published cases where this did happen, but it was interesting how the different, like in one hospital, they were able to save this woman who presented with this very rare side effect because they had been reading the reports and they had had you know, a number of meetings and they had geared up for it. So at a lot of your local hospitals, if you're using the, um, the J&J vaccine in your country and the AstraZeneca vaccine, your doctors and nurses may have, have had these discussions, the pharmacy team. So that can be an interesting story about, well, you know, did you prepare? You know, how did you prepare? What came of it? Those kind of things. Um, this is an interesting thing. So I, I was talking to Dr. Schaffner at Vanderbilt, who many of you may have talked to or heard of or heard speak. And in reporting on vaccine side effects, he um, always brings up the example of explaining to people, you know, when the rooster crows, the rooster thinks the sun comes up because he crowed. And um, the idea is that if people have a, a, something happens to them after they get the vaccine, especially with the COVID vaccine, they'll make that connection. And that's what we're seeing a lot with, um, with um, concerns about miscarriage and fertility with the vaccine. It's become very intense, um, the discussion about this and the debate. And a lot of it is so far the, the reporting on this, if you look at CDC, if you look at any of the other um, major medical associations, they all say that there isn't a connection, that what happens is people get the vaccine and then unfortunately things like miscarriage are very common, but people make that connection in their mind. And because these rumors are out there now, people are more likely even to make the connection. And there's been a lot of, obviously there was concern when the vaccines were being developed about um, how quickly we were going, um, how much data we had to date. So people really make these, um, they make these leaps. And this is something that's really difficult to, um, I don't wanna say address, but our, our emotional reaction to things is so much more important than the data. And a lot of times this is a case where you can't just say um, in writing the story, like I, I took this from the um, Royal College of Obst of Gyne obstetrician and gynecologists in the UK. And I thought they did, I have the link here again, because I thought they did a really nice job in putting this in simple terms and summing it up. And, and it's great to have something like this as a resource, but going back to that first time story I showed you, this is something where you can't just appeal to people with numbers. Like you have to address kind of why those concerns are out there and you know why people, you know, people make this leap. I was actually um, texting with someone I know about this where she said, well, I know someone this, who this happened to. And you realize it's gonna be very hard for her then to say, well, you know, here are the data and this is common. There isn't a link that once this link is made in someone's mind that, oh, someone had the vaccine and then something bad happened to them, that it's, you have to come at that very gently in terms of addressing it. Like a lot of 
I think a lot of times people who are, are very versed in this or know this, there, there may be almost like a scolding tone of like, well, that's not right. You know, just look at the data and that you really need to avoid that in reporting. Um, so the Association of um, Obstetrician and Gynecologists in the US has a lot of really nice resources on this. Um, they're really um, helpful too, if you need to find someone to talk to in your community, if you're in the US. Um, but outside of the US, again, your medical societies can be very helpful, especially if you give them a little bit of um, lead time on your story, if you give them some kind of clear direction on, you know, I'd really like to talk to um, an obstetrician who's, you know, talked with her own family about this. I'd really like to talk to a gynecologist about, you know, how he's addressing this with his patients. Um, and some of, so this is an example of where they had one of their members talking about, you know, how she's a mother, she's a, she's a doctor, and here's why she encouraged her daughters to get a vaccine. Now, that being said, and this is a great point that my colleague Tara made last week, Tara, on her um, presentation is that as a journalist, you're not an advocate for the vaccine. You're not a cheerleader for vaccines, but you are trying to help people understand um, here's what's happening, here's what's, here's what's actually real, and um, you know, here, here's what we know to date. And that's the really thing too in stressing this is that um, we're reporting what the scientists, what the medical community have, have put together as the best evidence. And we always have to caveat that this is what we know to date, you know, and that it makes it a little bit challenging when, when things are being reported that are just outlandish or just really some things are being reported that are just flat out false. So if you're countering that by saying, you know, you have to say, this is what the scientists, this is what the medical community doing its hard work has put together. And this is what we know to date, but you, you really need to put in the caveats and you really need as, as that first time story showed those really good voices, those when you're interviewing people, you know, even ahead of time, have a checklist where you're saying, I'm gonna need a quote set that, that puts this in context. I'm gonna need at the end of the interview to go back and be like, okay, so what do we know and what don't we know? Um, this is another story I thought was just really well done. This is from Vox just a few days ago on why the fertility claims have persisted so much. And sorry for this screen of text, but I just thought she did such a nice idea of um, tapping into how these things, why these things persist. And if you haven't seen it, um, Tara's presentation last week here with Paul was very good on this. She actually delved into the, the origins of these myths and, um, but in reporting this, even if you're doing a short story, a short, very you know, straight news story, keep this in mind. Like this, this isn't a case where we can just report the numbers and, and move on. Like you, you always need to explain why people are reacting to these numbers, why, how people, honestly, how people feel about, like you might not say in your story, this is how people feel about it, but realize just reporting the numbers by themselves won't, it won't get through. People who are already resistant won't, won't read that story. So kind of really walk people through and, and kind of um, and talking to people um, on this topic in general, talking to people and preparing for today. The, the theme was over and over, like meet people where they are, like realize that you need to, you know, kind of, this has to be a conversation. This can't be, you know, the news story tells you, the doctor tells the patient, this, this has to be more of a discussion. Um, so getting to some good examples, and this is one that I just love. Um, if you want to follow anybody on Twitter, this is Grady Doctor, and she is um, Kimberly Manning at uh, Emory University and at Grady Hospital in Atlanta. And she tells these great stories on Twitter sometimes about not revealing any details about her patients, but she walks you through just on Twitter. It's, a, it's like a short story. Um, of what happened in the clinic, right? So in this case, this is one of her cases of, and I love this, it's what's your why hashtag. So this is, you can see, and, and she's just an amazing writer. So she ran the clinic and just through the dialogue, she goes, she walks through discussions she had with the long-term patient. So um, you can probably, if you want to, you can follow her and see this, but in this case, she goes through about, and you can see her, her discussion with the patient, like, I think you're amazing. You know, what are your reasons? You know, like, oh, well, just, you know, tell me why you're, what your reasons are. This isn't Dr. Manning, who has a very impressive background and, you know, has, has um, academic, you know, posts at the university. This is just a one-on-one -on -one conversation about you tell me, you tell me the doctor, you know, what, what are the issues? And she just does this so gently. So in this one, she's going through this again. And, you know, she brings you into the scene of, her sitting with the patient and she goes through about the patient is scared of, you know, of, of the heights, the scared of 
letting her family down by taking the vaccine, by not taking the vaccine. And in the end, I think this is a case where the patient actually takes the vaccine. Now, I, Dr. Manning is great because she actually tweets cases too where she has these conversations. And in the end, her patient, who in some cases she knows well, will just say, no, I'm, I'm not persuaded. But she's just constantly, not constantly, I mean, I, she does this often, um, you know, giving us these real slices of what it's like to be a doctor, sitting down with patients and listening to them. And um, I just, I really, I recommend following her. It's just a great account. Um, this is another project that's just fantastic. And this actually, I believe, has some funding, Paul, from ICFJ. <laughs> this is Aos Fatos in Brazil. It's a great website, great news site. And they did, um, they call Artefato. So they have all of these um, artists looking at ways to discuss COVID and some cases looking at ways to discuss vaccination. And, you know, it's um, painting, it's cartoons, it's all kinds of neat things. And it's just, um, it's a really fun site if you have a little bit of time. Um, and this one I particularly like. So Cecilia Marins is a um, cartoonist and journalist. She's based in Sao Paulo. And she did a little comic book. Um, and I don't have the whole thing. So I really do encourage you to actually go back and look at it. I don't mean to chop up her work. But she shows like this conversation taking place. You can see people, if I had cut this better, are in the metro in Sao Paulo. And they are, um, they're discussing in, like some of the cartoon things, they're discussing the rumors that they read, like, like I, I read on WhatsApp that the vaccines are dangerous and that, you know, chloroquine it can protect you. And it's like, no, it's, she explains another one, like you don't want to take that. And um, I just love this because this one, you're in the Metro in Sao Paulo, or, you know, but for people who live in cities, this looks like the Metro all over the world. And, um, so it's like just people texting in this. It's a very normal conversation. Like it's taking this topic that's um, scary for a lot of people, that's um, very data rich. Sometimes when we report it, we'll go like right into the scientific jargon. And so we have people with their masks and they're on the Metro. And this one, I just love where she goes here. <laughs> Excuse me. This is saying like, um, they're talking about the AstraZeneca vaccine can cause thrombosis. That's that blood clotting we had talked about that's very serious. So a lot of times in news stories, like that's introduced with those jargon words I showed you, like thrombocytos, thrombocytopenia, TTS. You know, nobody knows that. But in this case, you have so here's somebody on the metro, they're talking about a thrombosis, like a clot, very natural. No, you know, they're saying this side effect is very rare. Um, the chance of it, you know, is um, very small. Um, loves it. Uh, they, she puts it in context about like if you were smoking or uh, taking birth control pills or being on a long um, plane trip, it's the same kind of risk you'd get. So I think this is just brilliantly done. <laughs> and it's my favorite cartoon. I'm kind of a wonky person. At the end of her cartoon, she cites her sources, which is not something you see in every comic strip. But I just, I, I can't recommend that site highly enough. Spend some time or block out some time. It's really charming. Um, this is another great site that I just um, like a lot, um, Animal Politico out of Mexico. And they did, um, they're doing fact checking, which everybody does, um, but just the way they presented their fact check. So if you go on their site, you can see they do it different ways. Like uh, this was out of context. Uh, this was false. Um, in this case, they're doing a backgrounder, but it's um, the way they present it, like it's very neat, it's very clear. Um, these are very short pieces when you get into them, but they, you know, they document their sources. It's just a way to really draw people in. Um, and this one, again, I really like because people could kind of go to it and pick and choose. They could dip into it. Obviously, it's something you can easily share on social media, which also was the case with um, Artefato, like this is going to catch someone's eye much more than a headline or a tweet about TTS or you know, VIP it. So, um, and then this it was Animal Political, right? Sorry, I just my screen is blocked here on this. So this is, that was sorry. This was right, and this is digging down on Animal Political. So this is their one on vaccines. So they're saying. Um, you know, if you look, they're saying the vaccines aren't dangerous. They don't cause, you know, infirmities. They kind of drill down into it. And I kind of wanted to pause here and talk about one of the, they look at some of the systems that are being used to check on the safety of vaccines. So we have Yellow Card, we have the European, the Vigilance Program. And I'm sorry to be, 
Eurocentric, but this is the one I know best. And it's actually, to be frank, the one that appears in a lot of things, right? The CDC serves, you know, as, as a good reference for a lot of things. So they bring up the VAERS program. And this is something that's really important to understand in covering this. This is from the CDC's own website. Um, and they say VAERS is this giant database, like the vaccine adverse events, you know, reaction, actually blanking on the rest of it, but VAERS. Um, this is where all of the um, side effects can be reported. But they're not, just because something's reported in VAERS doesn't mean it's a side effect of the vaccine. It means it's a report. Um, in the initial days, if you looked at some of the reports, they would be like someone in a nursing home who was very old and frail got the vaccine and then died a week later, but they died of something else. But because there was so much concern early on about the vaccine, they brought that into it. So they included that in the VAERS report. Um, so this is on the CDC site. They have, this is in English. They have had a report on VAERS. This is in Spanish. Um, a lot of the CDC resources are in English and Spanish, which can be useful if you're reporting in Spanish. Um, but the thing with VAERS is to remember that it, there's been a lot of misinformation out there about the VAERS reports, right? This is where a source of a lot of the misinformation comes from. People dip into the report or people have looked at raw numbers of VAERS reports and then they'll say, you know, there was X number of, fatality is associated with the vaccine or you know the x number of people had this because they're either deliberately or misleading people or they're just not understanding what they're seeing like if you're just because there were x number of reports to VAERS doesn't mean x number of people died um that's a really important point in reporting so i was saying that with VAERS in, in doing any of these stories think of um you may notice that i haven't given you any numbers in this story in this presentation. I didn't give you a number on thrombosis. I'm not giving you a number on myocarditis. I don't, if I report this today, if I went and gave you the best numbers for today, those numbers might not be good for tomorrow. So when you're reporting on these things, you always wanna use the best number. Um, CDC is a great source um, for US things, WHO. You wanna give your audience the best number you can find and put it in context of, you know, this number came from this study as of this day but really be careful about, um, this, is, this is my whole numbers thing. Numbers are like spices or herbs in your cooking, right? So you wouldn't wanna use an old spice, right? Like you don't wanna use some dried up spice in your cooking. Um, so if you use a number from like six months ago, six weeks ago, the number is stale. It's just, it's just not working. Now, this is something I struggle with. I write actually more for, um, I write more for the medical community directly than for the lay. So I have a little bit of leeway, but I do this. I have, sometimes I'll have too many numbers in my story. And then you've wrecked it, right? Like, have you done that with a dish at home sometimes? Like you can always, you can always add a spice in at the end. You can't like, if you've messed it up, if you have too many spices, if you've added too heavy a hand, you can wreck the dish. So numbers are like spices. You want to go gently with them. Um, this is another thing I just tell myself is number soup. Like sometimes if I write, and if you get a story from a study, a lot of times we have a tendency to do this, that we really want to explain to people what we've read. We really want to um, you know, make it clear to people. So you may end up with a story that's what I think of as there's a lovely bow of foe that I've added some numbers to, like number soup. Before you file your story, before you do your last read on it, um, I guess it maybe even Coco Chanel. There's somebody famous who used to say, like, before you leave the house, take off one accessory. Like, before you file the story, try and make a habit to pull like one set of numbers out. Like, what was the weakest number I had in here? And take that out. Um, finding the right voices, the same search PubMed. Um, every story you write as a journalist is important. Every story needs to be put in context. Every story has to be right. But at this year and at this time, if you're writing on vaccines, it, make a little extra time. Like let, the, let this be the thing where you kind of pause and step back. And I know it's so easy to say that and that we're, you know, we're journalists in 2021. We're all always under the gun. We never have enough time for what we want to report. But this is really an important one where you really need to feel like, did I, you know, did I not just report the numbers? Did I think about how people feel about these numbers? Like how are people going to react to this number? Um, and that's about it. For resources, there are a ton of resources out there. Some of the things we talk to, go to your medical societies, go to your local hospital, your local doctors, um, you know, things you're probably already doing. I will put in a pitch for HCJ. I think we're an amazing resource. Um, 
We have the special um, page looking at coronaviruses. We have an amazing topic leader on infectious diseases. In addition, she that's uh, Bara Veda. Uh, that's in addition to Tara, who you heard from last week, who's our medical studies person, who's excellent. Um, a lot of resources, it's a really great place to go. Another thing I would highly, highly recommend is the Knight Center in the Americas did, um, actually they did two sessions, but they did one just on the COVID vaccine. It was coordinated by Marin McKenna, who's an amazing journalist, and it's available in English, Spanish, Portuguese, and French. If you're really new to this topic, if you're, you know, even need to step back from that, they had a similar um, MOOC, like a online class last year, and that's now available in, I think, like eight languages. So it's something to look at. Um, the, it was really engaging. It's the kind of thing that you could put on in the background while you're doing other things and really get up to speed. Um, so in conclusion, just um, get the runway you need for these stories. Like really think that this is, this is a big plane you're bringing in. You're trying to tell your readers, not just the numbers, not just the numbers and context, but this is a case you really have to think about, like how is the reader going to react to these numbers? Like think about like you're in a conversation with the reader more so than you would in other stories. And then I will stop sharing. Thank you very much, uh, Kerry, for that. Um presentation and there are lots of questions for you already but okay. I think you stop, stop sharing and um but let me uh allow you to catch uh, some breath yeah uh, so for our audience um i'm curious to really understand how you how you've actually been impacted by um reports around uh, covid 19 vaccines uh um uh, potential side effects. So I'd like to, a question is popping up. Uh, what has been your reaction uh, to news on potential side effects of COVID-19 vaccines? Have you been worried, uh, indifferent, or uh, has it actually motivated you? So um, while Kerry takes her breath, I think, um, yeah, more about this is, Yeah, so how has it, how has it, how has it been? Um, have you been worried? Have you been indifferent? Or have you been motivated? So uh, largely um, people have been indifferent about it. And uh, so uh, Kerry, uh, what is your reaction? Uh, if journalists are indifferent about the reports on COVID-19 vaccines, uh, side yeah. effects, is it a good thing? I, I would say, um gonna be a long answer. So in developing these vaccines and watching them develop, I've been covering um, FDA and drug makers and this whole field for gosh, about 20 years. So um, when we were talking about this in 2020, I remember doing an interview, I think it was actually with Paul Offit, who's very well known in the field. And I remember he said something about vaccines like next year. And I thought I hung up and I was like, I don't even know if I'm gonna use that quote. How could we have all these vaccines in 2021? Um, so I, I have been really surprised by how quickly they came on board and honestly how easily this went. So I don't want to say I felt relieved when the side effects emerged, but I really did feel like, well, this is drug development. Like this is what happens. Like all, all products have reactions like this. So I don't know if worried is the right way, but vigilant. Like we need to, especially as reporters, right? And especially with something like the COVID vaccine where the natural impulse is that we all want a COVID vaccine. So as journalists, yes. we have to kind of be annoying people, right? Like the whole world can be like, isn't this great? We have this vaccine. And as journalists, we can allow ourselves like one second of like, yeah, that's great. Anyway, so about the side effects, like <laughs> what's wrong with the product? Like, yes, it came on faster than we thought. Yes, it's life-saving, but what's wrong with it? So Yeah, I agree with you on that. So uh, one of, uh, like I said, we have a series of questions for you. So the first one yeah. I'd like you to get is uh, results. Uh, is there comprehensive research explaining why young men are more predisposed to myocarditis uh, than women or other ages? And are stroke survivors more vulnerable to these vaccine side effects? Uh, do you have no. any response um, to this? I don't, Hazel. I think those are both great questions. And if you write on them, please, I would actually love to see that because those are really good questions. I think at this point, there's no comprehensive research um, on why because it's, we're so early into it. So I would, and I may be wrong on this. I mean, I, you know, this is just my guess, not having looked at it. So I would go into um, PubMed as always. Um, I would start my research there. That I keep that's 
And again, I'm sure you, all y'all have been using this, but just in case you haven't, it's such a great place to start. I'd really dig into it. But those are great questions. I would, I would, I really hope you write that story, please, and, and send it to yeah. me because I want to read it. Um, we're really guessing on a lot of this. Like this isn't something where, you know, and a lot of um, things like heart risk in general, NIH and, you know, other research institutions all over the world have been studying this and we've got great studies and they were designed from the beginning. And this we're kind of studying as we go and on the run. So short yeah. answer is I don't have an answer, but um, I would love to see the story and please feel free to email me if you think I can be any help in, in looking for people. I agree with you. That's also a story I would also love to oh. read. So please and please, whoever is writing that story, kindly share with us so that we can read it and share it also. So the next question reads as, uh, Dear Kerry, I do use email trackers to contact doctors, and if they do not reply, despite having opened my emails, would I have the right to say that they declined to comment? Wow, I would, um, I, you know, that's a really tough one. It depends on the doctor, right? It depends on the situation. So if I were just emailing people about their research, I mean, I would assume, um, it's, are you talking about a doctor who's, let's answer this two ways. If we're talking about a doctor who's just a doctor in practice, a doctor in clinic, a doctor in medicine, I would really give them a lot of leeway because we are still in the middle of a pandemic, right? And they may have opened your email and just not got back to you. So I would definitely continue emailing someone. And I'd probably avoid putting that in a story if I were just contacting a researcher out of the blue. If I were contacting a researcher about a paper they published uh, on which I was writing, and you had a question that you just couldn't answer, you'd really be within your rights to say it. I'd still really you know, email them a few times, maybe even tweet at them if I had to and say, listen, I, I really need to nail this down. If the doctor is a public health official, different story. Like if, if this is the email that you're talking, this the doctor is your local public health official, obviously the bar is much higher for responding that they have to get back to us. And then you're much more within your rights to say that. But I would be really cautious on that. That's just my take on it. Yeah, thank you. And I agree with you. Context really matters a lot um, when um, answering this question. So the next question is this, hi, what would you do if the proven latest vaccine related information might contradict the content that you just covered? Uh, how would you write the next article to uh, correct yourself? That's a great question. It's such an honest question. And it's, it's exactly where we're all at now, right? This is the difficulty of, of covering this. This isn't, we aren't in normal times where you know, normally as journalists who write on healthcare, what we write about is a, a study that's been carefully considered over time and you know, it's been published in JAMA and it's very slow and the, it's been thoroughly reviewed. I mean, a lot of times we're all writing on preprint servers, which you, if you'd asked me two years ago, I, I write a lot on healthcare. I tend to write really wonky stories. The idea that I would write something that wasn't in a peer reviewed journal like two years ago would have seemed very weird to me, but now it's the world we're living in. So that is a great question. In some ways, it's, 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 I, I wish I had mentioned that. So thank you for the question. Yeah, you should absolutely write the next story. And you should absolutely, the only thing you probably should have done different in your first story is to stress how thin the information is. So that, that's, that's a brilliant question. It's an important question. The only thing you would have done wrong in the first story, you don't need to correct yourself necessarily. If in all of our stories, as we write on this, we really convey to our readers, um, we share with them the level of uncertainty. If you're writing on something that was in a preprint server, which is a brilliant way to get out more information now, you have to let your readers know. And now your reader isn't, you know, a wonky healthcare journalist with a, you know, uh, a subscription to the New England Journal of Medicine. They don't know who Mike Bryan is. You know, they, you need to tell them when you're reporting from a preprint server, you need to flag this information. You need to, like, even in the first paragraph, you need to say, um, you know, this is an interesting finding that has yet to span the test of, you know, normal uh, processes in science for verification. And if we do this every time, and I know your, your editor might not like it, your producer might not, they'll fight you on this, right? Like you're your reader's advocate. They want clicks, they want readers, right? And who wants to read a headline that's like, early findings suggest possible, so who, everybody is going to fight you on that headline, but the more honest you are in every story about how little we know, the less you'll feel you need to go back and correct it. Like if you wrote a story saying, you know, something on the preprint server suggested this medicine works, right? And then another larger study proves it doesn't, your readers were kind of with you. Like you didn't give your readers an impression that was false. So I would say, yeah. 
Yeah, so the next question is this, what are your thoughts on determining the responsible uh, benchmark for reporting on new potential side effects if they arise? Mm -hmm. When there are a dozen related side effects reported, 1,000, in other words, at what point does it go beyond coincidence and become a side effect that may warrant responsible media coverage? That's another, wow, brilliant question. Um, I and this one, and people, this is this is my opinion. <laughs> um, I, at this point, I would really lean heavily on, like, if you have a trusted medical community in your country, like in my country, if CDC is flagging it, um, certain publications are flagging it, I would go with that. I, you know, I sit here thinking I'm a journalist, I'm not an MD, I'm not an epidemiologist. I, I may have spent a long time studying the field, but I am not, I write about experts. I'm an expert in telling you on what experts say, but I am not an expert. So I would really lean toward um, if you have trustworthy, you know, reliable scientists saying it's an issue and, and obviously caveating these things from the beginning. And that's, you know, this is the theme in all this. In the old days, like pre-pandemic, when we reported on medicine, it, things were calmer. A lot of things, was, things were more polished before they came out of the gate. Now we really are, are we're all kind of learning it together. We're learning, the doctors are learning, our readers are all learning at the same time. So I would, the short answer is really, I, I would hesitate on putting it out. Just, you know, I wouldn't look at my, if somebody, if it was on social media, you might feel you need to address it by going to doctors, by going to researchers. Okay, thank you. And um, the, uh, the question from Tiwonge Kambodeni Rizdos, in the absence of local research on the side effects of COVID-19 mm -hmm. vaccine, what would be the best approach to report on this side effects? That is a really, that's a really another excellent question. So if you're reporting on local research, meaning the studies aren't coming from your country, right? Like the, the side effect was reported in studies outside of your country. I would go to doctors in my country and ask them about that. Ask them about what they thought about the study or what they thought about the report from another regulatory body. Um, Again, I'm leaning heavily on CDC, but I would go to the doctors in my country, the doctors I know. And, you know, again, you can, you probably have your own sources of great doctors, but feel free to use that PubMed trick. Um, you could put in the side effect and your country and see if there's anybody in your country who's ever reported on this issue and then go to them with the research. That would be my tip. Okay, uh, Gabby Vinick uh... Uh, wants to know, uh, I carry, uh, it's an honor to hear you speak. I'm wondering what you think uh, is the biggest mistake journalists make in reporting on the vaccine and how do they, can they avoid it? That's a good question. Um, I think in reporting on the side effects, let's just, I'll stick with that side effects. I just, again, the, that times piece I flagged at the beginning, I thought did such a beautiful job. And um, this actually goes to a question I think too, I saw a little bit further up too about, you know, when you can't always do the reporting you want, which is all of us all the time. I mean, you know, please somebody let us know if they ever always get the time they need on every story is the, is failing to put things in context is, is really needing to get that deep breath is that when you're reporting on something that's this serious and this meaningful, you know, fight if you need to with your, be, be a good, I was, I was thinking the newsroom, you should give on the things you can give. Like if you have an editor who likes a particular verb and you hate that verb and they put that verb in your story, let that one go sometimes. So that way, when you're reporting this story, you know, you're the person who's always so reasonable and agreeable, but on this, you need to dig in and you, you need that extra hour to get the context. And I think that's the most important thing is to take a step back, use the simplest language you can and, and put things in context, which is hard to do. And we don't always have time to do. Okay, yeah, thank you, Kerry. And uh, the next question I would like to take uh, is this, uh, when you're on a tight deadline, and like you have said, you can't always report on what you want to, how do you approach that in terms of wanting to report a story with full accuracy, but your editor wants to break it first? Right. And it's, it's, again, this is, this is, I, it, you know, it's like all these things in journalism and I, I, I love sessions like this. I listen to all the webinars, but sometimes people are talking as if they're in some other world or they're like, well, do this and do that. I think the thing you need to do again is on some things in life, we can, you know, some things you can give in. Like if, if this is the editor you've talked to a million times, you, if you have a little, you can buy an extra hour to get that quote. Sometimes you just can't. Um, you need to really make sure 
look at the words you're using. Look at, look at, make sure that you're not going beyond what the report says, right? Make sure that you're, what you're writing doesn't go beyond what the study says, either in terms of the benefits of the vaccine, the risks of the vaccine. If you're really on tight deadline, if you really can't get ex extra context, you have to stick with that report, but hopefully too, you've done enough reading on your own and you've covered this that you, you can jump in and you can fill in some of the context. It's really important to read a lot on this and have that ready. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so let's take Hannah's question. Uh, so hi, Hannah Teller, uh, Farm Radio International. How do these lessons uh, or approaches apply to journalism in Sub-Saharan Africa? And uh, what other recommendations would you make for the context of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa? If I can give you a quick background, um, I think uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, tracking uh, COVID-19, the side effects, uh, potential side effects is still dragging. Uh, there are some countries where uh, the vaccines are even not available. Uh, mm. So how do you still report on potential, how do you cover this issue with that context of the continent? Right, and I, I, I would be really stumped on this because I have never reported from sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but you know, the, only, the only things I can offer, and I don't know how helpful they are, would be again, I would use PubMed. I would really use that to look in and find people who are in your country and, and who've done their search. I mean, this is, I keep saying this, but it's like, it's like the, the like, I don't wanna say sneaky, but it's like the best tool because if you kind of tweak your, your inquiries there, you can probably find someone in, in, in most countries who's either reported on like the side effect, who's done research on that area, someone who's done something, you can, you can look and before you kind of sometimes waste time on a source who may agree to talk to you out of kindness and doesn't know a lot, I, I would really use, go back to PubMed and, and see if there's somebody from your area who, who's, who's done that research. Okay, uh, okay. now uh, trying what we'd like to know uh, if uh, it would be okay, uh, stories are written, articles are written, I've written interviews and not spoken words. Uh, for instance, if it's like Q and A only uh, without drafting that story into a full piece, because if you do that, you're attributing everything. If you use a Q and A format, you're attributing everything uh, to the expert. But right. if you put it in a story, you are mixing things together. So what do you think? I think that's fine. I don't, I don't think there's any problem with that. I think too, a lot of times when you're um, working across time zones, when you're working with language barriers, I, I think there, I mean, you could say if you're, obviously it doesn't work if you're doing radio or TV, but for print, for web pieces, I think that's it. There's nothing wrong with that at all. I mean, your quotes might not be as zippy, but your quotes will be more accurate. And, and this is something, this came up a little bit in Tara's presentation, but when I'm reporting on things I don't know, I almost always ask people, I will run their quotes back to them because what if I get it wrong? You know, like what if, what if there was something in their language that I misunderstood? Um, there's a famous story in journalism about um, a reporter writing about mice and shrimp because the person said mice and shrimp and they didn't understand it. I once saw a reporter wrote, write about um, quoting a, a member of Congress saying there was a snowball's chance in, what was it? Haiti or something. And what the lawmaker said is an old expression, a snowball's chance in Hades, meaning, you know, Greek Hades. But the reporter didn't, had never heard that. They wrote it as Haiti. So always be, you know, let's be really humble about what we know, right? Let's be very in awe of what we're writing, but really humble about what we know. So there is, I don't think there's anything wrong with going back and forth in writing. I mean, it's sometimes too, especially if I'm reporting on a study, you know, an, an elaborate, if you're taking a four page study of, of you know, medical findings that are complex and dense, and you're summarizing that to a paragraph, I, I'm often happy to send that back to the editor, the, not the editor, the author, the researcher, and say, hey, look, these are the four paragraphs, these are the four sentences I'm using. You know, let me know if I'm wrong. Now they can't, you know, you're still in control, it's your story, but they can tell you like, oh, you know, you took that out of context, or no, I think this is more important. There's, the, I think there's, there's nothing wrong, especially, if you're going across language barriers and time barriers to using writing, writing comments. Okay, great. Uh, so this question, uh, an ethical one, uh, results are, will it be ethical if we produce the same story uh, with the same angle? Uh, with the first story having interviewed uh, three persons, A, B, and C, and the other having interviewed three other uh, persons, D, E, and F. Does that make sense? Do you understand um, the question? It does. I, th I think I do. So I, I don't think that's unethical at all. I mean, if your audience knows and you're, I mean, I'm assuming you're writing for the same publication. 
Um, but, you know, you're just, you're getting, you're going back to people. And, you know, that may have been something you wouldn't have done two years ago if you were writing on the latest finding on a cancer drug, right? But now, you know, A, B, and C, doctors A, B, and C may have completely different opinions from doctors D, E, and F. And they all represent what we know. So I don't think that, I think that would be fine. Okay, uh, the last question I, can, I would like to take, and think I've been saving this, uh, what tip do you have uh, for finding story ideas around uh, COVID-19 vaccine? I think you've given uh, some along the way already, but right. I guess if that you would like to share. I would really, you know, in, in preparing for this, I was really thinking about the, um, when you're writing on the stroke risk about, and I'm just going back to the thing I already said, but I think it would be really interesting to talk to your local hospitals to talk to your local medical centers about how they prepared for that, um, even if the patients didn't show up. Like there was one doctor I talked to, they were able to save the patient because they'd had that meeting, but that made me think, well, all these other hospitals did that. I think that could be a good interview to, to do just because that may open other doors. Like just to sit down with the, the doctors and nurses and pharmacists in your community and, and ask them, what, what haven't we covered? You know, I mean, I think we all do this when you, when you get a nice interview with someone, you've had you know, more than a, a, a two minute phone call, that's always your best last question, right? Is what haven't we talked about, right? What, what, what haven't we covered? What, what haven't we said that's important? So I, I think this is a case again, where we need to be humble about what we know and, and really reach out. Yeah, that question you mentioned is actually one of my favorite mm -hmm. questions too, when I'm doing an interview, after asking everything. And uh, I think many times uh, they usually say really good uh, stuff uh, from that. And uh, so uh, while uh, before I come to, uh, to carry for the last question, I would like to know um, how our participants feel about this training. Has this webinar improved the understanding of potential side effects of COVID-19 vaccine? Um, yes, so it's a solid 100%. So that means uh, Kerry has done uh, an amazing job. So 80 to 20. So thank you very much, Kerry. And like you, the question you mentioned, uh, is, it, um, is there something that you would still like to tell our participants regarding uh, vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine reporting that we've not mentioned yet. Is there any bony topic on your mind? I'd like to I, answer it. I really think, and this is something that I think a lot of journalists may struggle with in writing on this, is that um, a lot of us spend our time, you know, immersed with researchers. We, we really understand the, the work that's gone into this. We really understand the, the seriousness that people have taken in, in tracking side effects and taking care of this. We, you know, I, they're far from perfect. I love that question about, you know, what happens when the thing you knew yesterday, thought you knew yesterday, you know, turns out to be wrong. But um, I think sometimes that we may feel impatient when people just say, well, I heard one thing, like, you know, it's, it's a little bit frustrating when you have the feeling that like, um, you know, a, a message from somebody's cousin on WhatsApp means more than all of this like, serious study and research that's been done. And to, to really step back when reporting and not bring that into it. Like, that's why I brought up those, those wonderful, I, those tweets from Kimberly Manning or, you know, the really gentle way that they, um, Alex Fox was used to get into it, that just to, to really remember that it's, it's how people, um, Dr. Schaffner from Vanderbilt kept making this point when I talked to him, it's how people feel about this. Like we can pepper them with numbers all we want, but unless you reach people, it, it doesn't matter. Yeah, so, and, um, and I'm also asking, and uh, all, all of our participants, all, all the respondents in those polls said uh, this webinar will also uh, improve their reporting on COVID-19 uh, vaccine. So which simply means that uh, our job here uh, has been, uh, we've been successful in this and I really, really want to appreciate and thank you uh, for taking our time uh, to be with us today. It's, I know you are very busy and uh, you also have a very, uh, I said it. So thank you very much for thank taking us time. Paul. And uh, as, as extension, I also want to appreciate uh, the Association of Healthcare Journalists uh, for partnering with us uh, in these two parts webinars. And um, it's been eye-opening regarding what uh, participants or journalists across the world need to know in order to be able to improve how they report on the COVID-19 vaccine. And like we said, uh, what if, if you are writing any story on COVID-19 vaccine, I'll, I'll be glad to read it and also share it with 
uh, with other members of the ICIJ community. Please get your stories on COVID-19 vaccine across to me. If this webinar has inspired a story, uh, I would like to know, please share those with me. And uh, to get more information about the ICIJ Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum, I encourage you to search for the forum, uh, go to Facebook and search for ICIJ Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum so that you can be part of our, our Facebook community and we can share resources uh, with you. I also encourage you to access more information and resources via the uh, IGNet platform. Uh, so you go to uh, www.ignet.org. And the uh, Association of Healthcare Journalists also has a very robust uh, website, I think, healthjournalism.org. So uh, thank you very much for participating in today's webinar. And I, from me, I say bye. And uh, Kerry, have a lovely day. You too. Thanks, Paul.